All right, as you keep introducing yourselves, we're going to get started here in just a moment. All right, everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Elizabeth Brewer. You can see me waving here in the uh, WebEx window, and I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Dr. Emerly Peterson. Uh, we are your hosts for today, and we are here for the inclusive care sessions. This is an education series. Today's session, we'll be talking about caring for geriatric patients. So if you've missed our previous sessions, those are available on the cloud in the MedStaff Services site. We had a great series on caring for LGBTQ patients and one on caring for tribal patients as well. So today to talk about geriatric patients, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I just have a couple of items for housekeeping here. Um, first, uh, we were able to um, offer this series for both CME credits and nursing CEUs. You'll also be able to obtain a, a certificate of completion if you have other organizations that will accept it from, you know, cross um, departmental. And so none of the presenters today have any um, disclosures to make regarding a conflict of interest. And then in addition for housekeeping, we're going to ask you to please turn off your video, which I might do for you if we end up with some bandwidth issues. So we just wanna make sure that we've got good connectivity for the session. Throughout the session, if you wanna go ahead and chat in any questions you might have, we will have a panel Q&A at the end after all of our guest speakers have presented. So we'll save up your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, and then Dr. Peterson and I will help moderate the Q&A at the end. Um, at the very end, we will have information on how you will obtain your continuing education certificate. And then I just wanted to share again that this WebEx is being recorded and we will make it available after the session on our MedStaff Services site. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Peterson to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and um, thank you so much for coordinating everything here. Uh, this is, she's amazing at this. So um, I am really, really excited for our program today and excited to see so many people logging in to, um, to watch. Our uh, presentation is on caring for geriatric patients. Um, we have, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, we've been having this lecture series, trying to do it approximately quarterly um, to keep up with, um, you know, top of, the, top of the line care for all patients that come through the doors of Kootenai Health. Um, first, our first presenter today is uh, Sue Melchiori. Uh, Dr. Sue Melchiori is an internal medicine geriatrician who's been practicing in Coeur d'Alene for the past 25 years. Um, she is currently doing house call medicine um, through her organization on-site for seniors, and she is geriatric faculty for the Family Medicine Residency and North Idaho Memory Clinic. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled that she can join us today, and she'll be speaking on caring for geriatric patients, challenges in obtaining care. Sue, you can take it from here. Great, thank you. And I'll turn my video on shortly just to wave, say hi to everybody. I really appreciate that we're doing this topic and, and all of these topics, in fact, on inclusivity of care. And I do have a disclaimer I forgot is that I myself am aging. So I'm not sure if that gives me a conflict of interest, but <laughs> um, I'm also gonna stop my video just to save bandwidth as well. Plus we'll focus on the slides. So. 
I think Elizabeth, are you forwarding the slides for us? Great. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So, 1st, I have to say that um, another disclaimer is the topic of this. The name geriatric care may be offensive to the very audience that we are trying to be sensitive to. So, just looking at Miriam Webster's definition for geriatric, I can understand why perhaps we don't like these terms, especially the, the unyoung here under adjectives. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So, truly, sometimes I like the term elderhood. And that was coined by Dr. Louise Aronson from UCSF when she actually describes aging as another chapter in life. So after adulthood, we come into elderhood, which is kind of perhaps a softer term. It's not lesser. It's not necessarily worse. It's just something different. And age, as we all know, has been estimated to be the most important determinant of health overall. And it involves many, many things. Truly, age is not just in our head, I'm sorry to say, although our attitude is super important. There are biologic changes of aging. There are genetic effects, but genetics only really account for about 25% of what we see in aging. And then there are these accumulated effects, which are interrelated factors, including environmental exposures, such as pollution, toxins perhaps, our own habits of smoking or drinking, social factors, the way we were raised, our cultural history and what's normative within our culture, our educational background and how we continue to pursue education or not as we get older. And then of course, socioeconomic support. Um, that is, these are extremely important factors. And as you can imagine, as these come into our lives over time, it results in a wide variety of, of outcomes. So if we go to the next slide, we really see that the health disparities are widely varied. We become less like others as we get older, but these are not random. And there was a really interesting article put out by the United Nations and World Health Organization about six, seven years ago that described this as accumulated disadvantages over time. I thought that was really a clever description. The next page or the next slide actually goes into the barriers to accessing care for seniors. So we are doing an eagle's eye view over this due to time today and just skimming the surface. So in 2010, there was a landmark survey that 63% of seniors reported having difficulty accessing health care. This is a significant portion, almost two thirds. And what I'm going to do today in the next uh, seven to 10 minutes is to just break apart some of these factors that cause barriers to accessing health care for seniors. Some are health care system factors. Some are actually patient factors and determinants and others involve both. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm going to first talk about the health care system factors and these are broken down into infrastructure and then provider issues so the infrastructure i'm sure we can actually come up with an even longer list but these are the ones that are most studied and most determined in the in the literature transportation challenges i'm sure everyone if i could see you you're nodding your head but yes that is very easy to understand, especially in rural areas where there is not a lot of public transportation. Often public transportation is not easily accessible to seniors or understandable in transparency. Um, the time to first visit. So we may not think much of having to wait three months or six months for a first visit, but if your life expectancy is 18 to 24 months, we're making that person wait a quarter of their remaining lifetime for the first visit. That's certainly not inclusive. The shorter visit length is also not helpful to seniors where a 15 minute visit is just not long enough to discover all that is going on and what's important, what matters most to that person. Our current healthcare system office environment typically is not user friendly for the older person, especially things like lighting, 
background noise print size technically. Our technology dependence also can focus or highlight the digital divide between the senior agers and the rest of the country. This is getting better, as you may have noticed. Um, COVID, if it's helped anything, is to promote telehealth. And many, many seniors are on board with doing telehealth. And in fact, technology awareness is increasing rapidly in the senior population, but there is still a gap for sure. The healthcare agenda, the healthcare system has its own agenda, as you as you may or may not realize. Um, things like our annual wellness exam for seniors. We come in with our own list of check things that we want to do. And often the senior has something totally else on their mind. And, and we can override that all too easily. Sometimes we bring up advanced care planning at the wrong time. <laughs> it's on our agenda, but they're not quite comfortable with that yet. So uh, interesting to keep in mind those differences that create barriers. And then our healthcare providers sadly have limited knowledge in age appropriate services. There is a very small percentage of time devoted to geriatric training in medical schools, in residency curriculums, and in all of the healthcare disciplines. In fact, we have a shortage of skilled workers at all levels, whether this is the front desk, the phlebotomist, um, the insurance worker, every level we need certainly more skill in the assisted livings and skilled nursing facilities, just having that knowledge of how to communicate better with folks of different generations. Next slide. I wanted to think about the patient factors and here this doctor is laying it out straight. You're deliberately putting yourself at risk of ill health by being over 65. So I'm not quite sure what she's thinking, but we could imagine. So the next slide is going to talk about some of those patient factors. And there are common physical changes. And I want to be careful to say that these are common. They are not universal. So we, we don't want to assume that every senior has these issues. But they are common and they make accessing healthcare independently very difficult. These are sensory changes mobility limitations, cognitive impairment. And Linda Henrich is gonna talk next about the cognitive impairment piece, so I'm not gonna go into that. But suffice it to say that each one of these could be their own book. Um, there also is culturally in the United States a mindset with the greatest generation and the older generations that is fiercely independent, but not assertive. So how many times have you heard someone say, I really don't want to be a burden on my children? Oh, my dear doctor is so busy, I don't want to bother her. This is, this is creating a barrier. Our healthcare system, believe, realize it, acknowledge it, accept it or not, requires the user to be assertive. And so uh, for this mindset in this generation, they are, are not assertive. And there tends to be this learned helplessness phenomenon. If you've not heard of this, it's sadly a condition that many um, folks in the older age range adopt, often in long-term care settings, but after multiple um, offenses or feeling ignored, they simply stop trying to communicate. So next slide. I wanted to review quickly some of the universal factors. So these are things that happen on, on all sides. Um, First is a lack of resource awareness, both on the provider healthcare system side, as well as the patient family side. Um, I have attached an appendix of resources, and I know Linda has also done that, but suffice it to say, this is woefully short and um, it changes all the time. So keeping up on resources needs to be something that is easy to do. Costs, um, the costs of healthcare disparities are, are huge. So many things create barriers that are costs. Insurance industry is, let's say, it's very complex, right? And I don't understand oftentimes a healthcare bill, let alone uh, 
someone that doesn't work within the healthcare system trying to decipher these. Often seniors will not pursue services, especially preventive services, because they're not sure it will be covered. There's a myth that the older a person gets, the more expensive their health care is. The truth of this in looking at healthcare expenditures in the United States is that expenses peak at age 70 within the healthcare system, and then they actually start to drop. That doesn't mean though that the personal expenses aren't rising, because in fact, the person's individual expenses do start to rise after age 70 those home care services that are not covered on insurance, perhaps. Informal care, maybe a family member has to take off work and the cost of not working. The unmeasurable costs of lost relationships, someone having to move out of their long standing homestead, losing neighbor relationships, or having to move in with family or being isolated in a new setting. There's also this vulnerability factor that certainly this age range is a target by scammers. And lastly, ageism is a topic that I want to touch on. Um, we all are familiar with the term, but within healthcare specifically, again, Dr. Aronson calls this dismissing an older person's complaint simply because the person is old. And I, I challenge us all, you can go to the next slide, to go ahead and take an ageism quiz. There's a lot of these online. The one by Ohio State Medical Center is very good. The age bias knowledge check only takes a couple of minutes. Or Harvard's implicit age IAT is also very good. But there's a number out there and just do it by yourself. See what you learn. You might, might be surprised some of the hidden biases. So we can go to the next slide. These biases all have results. So there is not a bias that doesn't result in something. And this list is taken from the Ohio Medical Center study group, and they've compiled some of the most common biases that do have significant healthcare results. For example, the healthcare system does tend to imagine that seniors are inflexible or unteachable. And this often does result in lost care opportunities and, and strained provider patient relationships. Even within the psychology and psychiatry community, mental illness is, is thought to be normative as people get older to a degree, such that the studies do show that older persons are less likely to be treated for depression, even though their depression complaints match those of younger folks. They're also much, much less likely to be referred for counseling. Often there's a bias toward older population being hard of hearing or mentally slow. And this results in that, that horrible elder speak, right? Where we, we talked, we hear someone, a senior being addressed with a high pitched childlike patter and, and that or very loud offensive speech. And again, this, this is definitely gonna detract from the provider patient relationship. Interestingly, pain and other nonspecific symptoms are also considered normative. I want you to think about the anecdote of the 92 year old man who goes into the doctor's office complaining of left knee pain. The doctor examines his knee and he says, well, you know, Joe, your knee is 92 years old. What do you expect? Now that is sadly a very common comment that people hear. And Joe, you know, if he's assertive enough, he might say, well, that's true, doc, I am 92, but my right knee is just as old and it doesn't hurt. So maybe we need to consider that. Um, pain certainly is not addressed as seriously. There tend to be less diagnostic evaluations and much less referrals for exercise and lifestyle treatments, which actually could be helpful even at older ages. There's an assumption that seniors are not sexually active, where truly 50 to 60% are sexually active, or we assume they are all teetotalers and not using alcohol. Again, this can lead to missing diagnoses of related diseases. And lastly, there's an assumption that there's a poor resilience. And this is a community-wide, nationwide bias that seniors have less resilience. There tends to be decreased referrals for surgery, cancer care, 
and rationing of care even in crisis modes. This might change if our country realizes the age of our president, <laughs> the age of Queen Elizabeth, and even the age of Paul McCarthy, who's going to come out to give a concert here shortly. There's certainly value and resilience in these aged folks. The last slide, please. Um, so truly, we want to look at the person. We want to treat them and not their age. So I am going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Peterson again, or I'm not sure if Linda's stepping in or if Dr. Peterson's stepping in. So thank you for listening. Oh, wow. Um, Dr. Melchior, thank you so much for that um, excellent talk. I have to say I am um, guilty of speaking offensively loud to people uh, from time to time. I, um, you know, you'll see a couple of patients in a row who are hard of hearing and the next thing you know, you're yelling all day long. So I appreciate you for calling that out. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Next on our agenda, we have Linda Henrick, who will be speaking to us on um, equity and inclusivity in dementia care. And Linda is the geriatric nursing practice specialist at Kootenai Health. She's been a board certified geriatric nurse for 10 years, and she has completed many hours of dementia care training in order to help improve care for those who suffer with dementia. So we're extremely lucky to have her here with us today. Um, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm just really excited that I have the opportunity to share some information um, with all of you regarding um, our care of dementia patients and some of the struggles that they um, incur when they're accessing the healthcare system. So you can see I'm going to wave too. I'm going to do the same thing Dr. Melchiori did, and I will stop my video. Um, but that's me. I'm here. Okay. So one thing that we tend to do is that when we hear the, the term dementia, we kind of go into this idea that they can't make their own decisions anymore. And there are really many different stages of dementia. I know it's narrowed down to mild, moderate, or severe. But at times, you know, families and care providers forget that the person living with dementia does retain um, many abilities for quite a long time, and they are still the person that they once were. They're just different. So due to the degenerative nature of the disease, processing information um, takes a little bit longer. And going back to this time frame, um, everyone's in a hurry. We have tasks that have to be done. We have to get, we have to move through what we're doing. We don't always allow that person living with dementia the time to process the information or even respond to questions. They might look at you with a blank face while they're processing and you just think they're ignoring you or they don't want to answer. But because of this, People living with dementia really can become frustrated. They can withdraw. They can become ornery. They can uh, become very depressed. So I want you while I'm talking here to just take a moment and think about each step that you would need to complete to go from lying in bed to standing up. And I think if we have any physical therapists on this, they can probably run through these steps pretty quickly because they do it with their patients every day. But the healthy brain actually can only hold about five to eight steps at a time as we sequence through different things. So I go back to trying to get directions to something, and I'm good with the first three or four turns, but then I lose it after that. And I have not been diagnosed with any type of cognitive decline. There are days that I wonder. So a brain that is suffering with dementia can really maybe only hold two directions at a time. So if you're saying, okay, roll out of bed, roll to one side, swing your legs over the side of the bed, sit up, um, slide to the edge of the bed, put your feet on the floor, put your, you know, use your hands to push off, to push off of the bed, to stand up. Now wait, straighten your legs and don't forget to stand up straight and look forward. Um, that's a lot of steps for a person with dementia to really take in without that time to process them. So we really have to provide a little bit more time. 
Um, there's also early detection. And one of the issues with early detection is that that bias that aging causes memory problems. Age, this is just part of aging. And while it is part of aging, it is not normal aging. Um, our risks obviously go up as we um, increase in age, but that doesn't mean that we actually um, have dementia. So an early diagnosis is really important. Um, one statistic here is that in Idaho, about 10%, one in nine people report cognitive changes, that they feel that they are experiencing cognitive changes. But more than 60% of those don't ever report it to their healthcare provider. Now, Dr. Melchiori did mention these, um, and I, I forgot how she said it, but those standard things that we have to look at on that first visit, we have to screen them for depression and we have to do this and we have to, you know, mobility testing and all of these different things that are just part of that initial assessment. Um, so if the patient is not gonna talk to us about concerning for their memory or cognitive changes, when do we actually do this evaluation? And then the next thing is who actually should do this evaluation. So Alzheimer's disease and related dementias are really described as a neurodegenerative disease rather than a psychiatric illness. And of course, many of them can have psychiatric symptoms such as hallucinations, paranoia, that type of thing. But it's due to the neurodegenerative changes causing all of this imbalance within their brain. So who really owns that task of screening and diagnosing these patients? Is it psychiatry or is it neurology? Or maybe it's just the primary care physician who may not have a lot of that time, as Dr. Melchiori said, in training to care for geriatric patients. Or maybe it should be specific to geriatricians, which is another big problem because there aren't a lot of uh, board certified geriatricians available to care for our population here in Northern Idaho. So just a quick story. Um, recently I was with a patient and that patient was refusing care. They didn't want the care. They may not have understood what the staff were trying to do for them. But when forced, that care was forced on her, she become violent. She would hit, kick, bite, whatever it was to make her point that she didn't want to be touched. And the staff actually, I overheard the staff talking about that, well, maybe we need to force this on her and then she's gonna be violent and we'll have to medicate her. Well, that's not necessarily how things should be. We should really value what the patient is trying to communicate to us. And they were either communicating they really didn't want this care at this moment in time, or they were communicating they didn't have a good understanding of what we were trying to do. So we have to really think about the brain is changing and these people don't have any control of how that change is happening. So as a care partner, we really need to be the one to change our approach because we can, we, are, we have the ability to make that change. And that statement there is uh, from Tipa Snow, who is uh, the founder of Positive Approach to Care, who is actually providing a lot of the training that our staff will be having. So go ahead, next slide. So public knowledge is really limited regarding Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As I said before, it may be considered normal aging. And again, aging does increase this risk, but it's not normal. And the lack of understanding really does create a delay in diagnosis and advanced care planning. And as Dr. Melchiori also mentioned, that many times uh, these patients are not ready to talk about advanced care planning, but it's a lot easier if they um, have a good cognitive ability to actually process that. So really finding out what matters to all of our patients over the age of 65 is very important. So again, once diagnosed with dementia, we tend to look at what the person has lost than what remains. And I'm gonna say again, we have different stages of dementia. And 
some of these people that are living with dementia have mentioned a frustration that when they state, well, yes, I have been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, the response is, well, you don't seem like you have Alzheimer's. Well, that's great, but it's, they're in the early stages. So we really need to look at these people as the people that they have always been and not focusing on what they've lost, but looking at how things have changed and how we can change our approach to them to improve, improve our communication. Um, a lot of this has to do with really knowing the person before dementia. What did they like to do? What was their profession? Um, what were their hobbies? Because that can give us a lot of insight into how we can better provide care for them. Um, if we have a person who was a professional, uh, a female, who never had children and devoted her entire life to her profession, and we're trying to provide a diversion activity such as a baby doll for her, it's very likely to become more of a weapon for her than anything that will be um, beneficial to her. So again, just really understanding the person. And again, I had the pleasure of talking with a gentleman for quite a while one day. He had a doctoral degree in physics and a minor in metallurgy. And I had never heard that word before. He was the most generous man and he was so willing to share with me all of his knowledge about metallurgy, which did take quite a bit of time, but I was so happy and he, he felt that he was providing some wonderful, he was just, he was being productive. He was sharing information with me that I was happy to learn. So again, think about patients that are living with dementia. Um, they do fall, they do fracture hips. Now, we always provide very specialized care for those, so it's an orthopedic surgeon, um, but what about the underlying dementia? We really don't have anything uh, mandatory for any type of healthcare provider to require them to understand dementia, what it is, or how to care for our patients, and that's physicians, nurses, CNAs. So, as we already said, I am in the process of building a team of certified trainers and coaches who will be providing education and support for all of our bedside staff. So hopefully by the end of 2022, we will be able to show a great improvement in understanding these patients. Another story that I want to share with you is a patient that was admitted with COVID. And we know COVID has <clears throat> created a lot of issues um, for many patients, but specifically our elderly patients. But really, our patients that have dementia suffer greatly. And this one patient, his wife was his primary care provider and she provided very good care for him. But he was so sick, she had to call the um, emergency, that 911, to have him picked up and brought to the hospital. And he was in such a state that they rushed in, they bagged it, they packaged him up and they were out of the house. And she was in tears because she felt that he didn't understand why she had sent him away, that he would felt that he had done something wrong. Now, he couldn't use a phone. He was pretty severe with his disease. Um, she couldn't visit because of COVID and she didn't have any access to technology. So we were able to set up a FaceTime for her and him through our wonderful guest services. And they were able to communicate with each other, see each other, and both of them just, it was a huge success, um, really helping them. Going back to our fractured hips and these patients presenting with um, injuries, there was a study in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, and it was done back in uh, 2000, but it had found that advanced dementia patients received one third of the amount of morphine sulfate equivalents, so uh, morphine as the cognitively intact patients. 44% of the cognitively intact, so those without any dementia, reported severe to very severe pain preoperatively, and 42% reported similar pain postoperatively. So half of the cognitively intact, so no dementia, who experienced moderate to very severe pain 
were prescribed inadequate pain control for their level of pain. But 83% of those that had a, I'm sorry, 83% of those cognitively intact patients and 76% of dementia patients did not receive a standing order for a pain med. So this data really shows that the majority of our elderly hip fracture patients experience undertreated pain, which leads to other risk factors for delirium in addition to the dementia. So there was also a study done in a long-term care facility where they, it was just by observation, they watched these patients um, in the facility and through observation determined that about 80% of them were suffering from some sort of pain. And through that study, they determined that they would place them on uh, every six hour Tylenol to help reduce that pain, which was very successful. So when thinking about the patient's loss of ability to effectively communicate, we really need to not force ourselves on them, but work to change our approach to help them understand what we're trying to do. Um, forcing ourselves is almost, could almost be seen as they don't have a right to make a decision on how they are treated. So, and again, this was uh, another patient who was refusing care and the staff really, really wanted to make sure that she was comfortable and they, they had the best uh, intent for this patient but because this patient didn't really understand what was happening, it turned into um, kind of a fight and where she was pinching and scratching. And it was just very sad um, for both sides because it could have turned out significantly different with, the, um, with training and understanding. So go ahead and to the next slide. So these are some dementia care resources. Um, this is on-site for seniors. And on-site for seniors, uh, I'm going to, I took it right off their website. It's a nonprofit, faith-based team approach to meeting the needs of the whole person and their family by providing medical care through on-site house calls and telehealth services and connecting them with resources and compassionately sharing the love of God through the adult day center, respite care, resource coaching, and spiritual support and social visits. Um, right next to on-site for seniors is the North Idaho Memory Clinic, which as far as I can see is the only place close that actually provides for the diagnosis of cog cognitive impairment. Um, they also partner with persons, um, they partner that person with a primary care provider if they have one and psychiatry as needed. They also employ social workers who can assist with additional support needs. And then we have the Alzheimer's Association. And of course, the Alzheimer's Association is the Washington chapter, but they're also branching out into North Idaho, knowing that we have a great uh, need for their resources. And they provide resources, uh, support, as well as educa educational courses that are designed for the lay population. So this is for those people that are trying to care for their loved ones and also professional education. They did have support groups, in-person support groups prior to COVID, but currently they're just being offered virtually. And unfortunately, there, I have not found any uh, current support groups specifically for the people living with dementia, but I think that would be a great addition to our community uh, resources if we are able to do that. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much, Linda, and those, those personal experiences and stories mean so much. And thank you for providing those local resources that we can turn to um, if we do have these, these patients that we're seeing in clinic. So um, wonderful talk. And um, I am so excited to have uh, Dan and Linda Green joining us. Um, they are going to be speaking about a family. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> They're going to be speaking Hi. about a family's experience in navigating care for elderly patients or parents. Sorry. Um, so Linda is going to be doing the the speaking today. Um, she is identifying as a wife, mom, daughter, caregiver, and friend, and we are absolutely thrilled to have her here, and uh, Dan as well to talk about um, your experiences caring for Linda's parents. So thank you and welcome. 
Oh, and uh, just you. one housekeeping note. Um, please chat in any questions that you have um, into the chat box, and we will be addressing any questions for all of the pre presenters at the end of the talk. So thank you, Linda. And turn it away. Thank you. Well, we're just going to be on here for a minute, just like everybody else. I just wanted to say, wow, I'm honored to join into this forum and, and to be part of uh, this, this discussion. Uh, there's some wise uh, and caring individuals here today. So thank you very much. Um, I don't have any slides, so you'll just have to listen to my voice. And I have the experiences. That's what I have to share today. So I'm going to pop off of here. So before I start sharing some of my experiences um, uh, with caring for my elderly parents, I want to share with you that I, they were very blessed with having the ability to afford care. They had their children involved in their care. And my mother had been a registered nurse and a social worker. So speaking of care, let me start with commending the quality of nursing care that they have received in their time in the Coeur d'Alene area. Whether my mother or my father was hospitalized or being cared for at home by a home health care agency, the nursing care they were receiving was wonderful. We found that the home health agency also provided valuable information to our family that helped us as we were trying to care for them. So over eight years ago, I moved my parents to Hayden to be close enough to oversee their care. It wasn't a very willing transition, but they understood that it was time for them to be closer to one of the family. At that time, our local family doctor was able to add them to his patient roster. My mother, who was a strong and independent and very intelligent lady in her prime, was one of those who didn't want to bother anyone or to, didn't want to use up uh, resources that others might need. I should note here that my mother had lost a kidney many years ago, but was doing well with the one that was remaining. She was my father's primary caregiver, caregiver for many years, and some of the illnesses that my father lives with currently are diabetes, ulcerative colitis, prostate cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. In May of 2018, I took my mother to our family doctor as I was concerned she was developing a heart condition. She was able to get in, he was able to get her into a cardiologist within a couple of weeks, and it was quickly discovered that she had major blockages and was advised that she should consider having stents placed. Now, as my mother was aging, she shared that she really didn't want any aggressive procedures, nor did she want to go on dialysis should that need ever arise. Unfortunately, those ideas were now being challenged, and her, her cardiologist encouraged her to uh, undergo angioplasty and stenting. We spoke about it, and um, she was hopeful that the procedure would go well, so she agreed to it. She went, wanted to be able to continue to be present for my dad and to return to the garden that she so enjoyed. So mom soon underwent that what sadly was an unsuccessful attempt to insert the stents. At this point, the only remaining option offered to her was to see a thoracic surgeon for a triple bypass surgery at the age of 87. Mom was able to have her family present at the consultation where her surgeon stated that although she was 87, he felt that she her health was better reflected as someone who was maybe 77. During work hours. He warned that he couldn't promise the outcome, okay. but was confident I she could really do well. How often she's going. She then met with a nephrologist to assess whether her one kidney could take the surgery. It was felt that although she may require dialysis temporarily, the nephrologist believed her kidney could survive the procedure. Her outcome was not as rosy as she had been led to believe, and mom never regained her strength after her open heart surgery. And once she was placed on dialysis, she did not come off of it until she made the decision to discontinue it on December 27th of 2021. Mom made a peaceful transition into Jesus' presence a week later, surrounded by her children. Within a week of mother's passing, her, we moved my father into a memory care facility, and his transition was very smooth, which was a very big blessing to the old family. Now, when our family, well, excuse me, when our family doctor later retired, I was disappointed with the hunt for another doctor as it was so difficult. Searching for a physician to take over their care, I discovered that many were not seeing new patients or not accepting Medicare. 
And when I did locate a doctor, the wait to see that doctor was between six and eight months and some were even longer. Fortunately, our newly retired doctor was able to share a different idea with us. Our family is now being seen by a direct primary care doctor. If you haven't heard of this before, you were right where we were. Direct primary care doctors charge a monthly fee and do not bill insurance for their services. So once we signed mom and dad up, our family doctor now was able to see them very quickly, and he is just a text or a phone call away. He's very accessible to his patients. Within the last year, my father who has, has had to go uh, to the ER twice. I know that's probably not as often as some, but <laughs> it's still too many for my, my care. The care that he received in the hospital was good, but when the time came to discharge dad, communication could have been better. On one occasion, after he fell at home, my brother brought him into the ER. After running tests, he was discharged and my brother was given Tylenol to give to him with no follow-up instructions other than to see his primary care doctor. He was mobile with a walker prior to the fall, but afterwards when he was discharged, he could no longer walk nor stand without assistance. We felt completely unprepared for the amount of care that he would need, now need at home. I should mention that we already had some home health care in place at this time and that they were able to re recommend some very helpful tools to us, like a transport chair or a sit to stand. And neither of us, uh, neither, neither of these were mentioned by the hospital, nor were we aware of them. Two days after arriving home, my dad, dad suddenly became unresponsive while in the transport chair and my brother called 911. Dad was transported by EMTs back to the ER. This time I accompanied my father to the ER as he had also become nonverbal. Within the next 24 hours, the hospital diagnosed him with sepsis and he was admitted. After four days at the hospital, he was discharged. The process of discharging was very difficult. I received a call from the hospital the day prior to his discharge saying a social worker would be calling to, dis to discuss his need to move to a transitional care facility. I received the call the next day, and in addition, the caller informed me that they had already reached out to some facilities to care for dad, and only two were available that would take him that day. I was caught completely by surprise by the speed at which things were moving. Plus, I didn't have the opportunity to pursue other facilities because he was being discharged that afternoon. As a side note, when my sister and I were searching for a memory care facility for dad, we visited six different facilities until we found two that we thought would be good fit for him. The transition from the hospital to the transitional care facility went worse than the previous discharge when my dad was sent home. In communicating with the nurse there at the facility, I asked, how was my dad's blood sugar doing? It was then that we discovered that dad had not been receiving his short acting insulin. According to the employee at the facility, they had not received the sliding scale that he was when he was discharged. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and mention an idea we would like to see offered to others in the future. My mother always wished that she could talk to another dialysis patient about their experiences. And we know that there are many types of support groups for individuals, but we're unaware of one for dialysis patients. I think she would really like to know that this wish could come to fruition one day. A tremendous resource for us while my parents were still at home was a private pay, non-medical home care company that could provide overnight care for my father so my mother and my brother could get some sleep. This service was very expensive. In fact, my father's current full-time memory care is less expensive than having the nighttime caregiver come to our home each night to watch and care for him. That's me. That's I'm done speaking here. I'm shifting over to Dan, who has definitely been a, a big part of this uh, navigating this life here with parents yeah i had uh this is dan green i had an interesting role and i think i was the caregiver for the caregiver um what i observed over the last six to seven years and especially the last three years of her parents living at home was how do others provide for the care that my wife and her brother did her brother who at 62 moved in and lived with his parents the last three years they were in their home did the best he could, but was never trained or equipped for this, nor would I be. In addition, my wife was at her parents' home 
almost daily for several years managing their care and personal affairs. Our grown, our grown sons are out of the house and Linda doesn't work outside the home in like a paying job that would have taken up much of her time. She had the time to be with her parents that I think many people would not have been able to do. I can't imagine how others do it without the resources that are available to us. In addition to having Linda, in addition to Linda having the time to do it, we have multiple medical professionals that are personal friends of the community who all happen to be about our age and many of them have aging parents too. So they could um, give us what I would call honest, objective counsel as we navigated through this process. So, so many times non-medical people um, maybe not understand everything that the medical professional is speaking to us, just like sometimes when you visit your attorney and they're using words you don't understand. This was a case where our medical professional friends could speak Dan and Linda Greenies, where we could understand what they're trying to say. Um, and that was a tremendous blessing, having these friends that could help us navigate through the process. I think we're going to stop there and hope we can expand on the topics or, and or answer questions that maybe we have not touched on. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your experiences. That um, was very brave and honest, and I'm just humbled by your willingness to share with us. Um, so thank you, and it's so incredibly powerful to hear such a personal story um, of actually how it is to have aging parents and um, try and navigate through the healthcare industry. So I appreciate you, and I, I have not forgotten about your dialysis support group. I am um, going to be working on that, I promise, and I will honor your mom. So um, a couple of questions that came up. Um, I think uh, this may be a good one uh, for Linda um, Henrik. Uh, Shirley Miller asked um, if there were any tips for determining whether a dementia patient has delirium or what their baseline, or whether they may be at their baseline mental state and have some deterioration. Um, Linda, do you have any, any answer for that? I do. Um, really in acute care, it, it's somewhat difficult because many of these patients are coming in because they're having a change in their mentation and illness can cause that state of delirium on top of the dementia. So uh, really it's under, understanding their baseline from family or from the facility that has sent them over to us is very helpful. Uh, we can also make that better or worse because a of course, with COVID, we've been very restricted in uh, having our patients out of the room, um, socializing with them, that type of thing, which could be very difficult for those living with dementia. And the lack of mobility is another area that is huge in the cause of delirium, is not allowing them to be up and moving. So um, determining what the cause is, is really knowing from their family, their baseline, and or the sending facility. There's also, uh, if we don't have any information, we can do a baseline mini cognitive eval, which takes about five minutes to do um, pretty quick, and there's resources on that on the delirium protocol. But uh, that can give us where they are right now, and then we can determine whether or not they're worsening, which can help us determine whether it's delirium or just their dementia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, the second question we had was from Della Jenkins. Um, I think this one would be for Dr. Melchiori. Um, she asked if there is a significant amount of geriatric training in the our family medicine residency program. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. I think that's a really good question. <laughs> Um, there is some, but it's small. So we have a geriatric clinic, which we're actually in the process of changing the name because people don't like to come to the geriatric clinic. So if you have a suggestion for the name of that, please put it in the chat. Um, <laughs> we do that. It's only, it's only a half a day a month. And then we do rounds in the long-term care setting another half a day a month. And then there is training, didactics, 
quarterly. So considering that, and that's pretty standard, that's pretty average across the country. So it's limited, I believe. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I see we have a hand raised from Pamela Sajewski. Maybe I, I hope I said that right. If you want to unmute yourself, you can feel free to ask. I think um, that's all the questions we had. Um, I just want to express my um, deepest appreciation for our presenters today. Um, thank you for making this an incredible experience for everyone who tuned in and uh, for teaching us so much. I, I really appreciate you and, and we all do. Um, I'll turn it over to Elizabeth for um, closing, closing comments on continuing education credit. Uh, I agree with Dr. Peterson. This has been a wonderful presentation and echo her remarks, thanking Dan and Linda Green for your uh, sharing your experience. It is always good and many of you have chatted in um, that it is helpful for us as caregivers to hear your experience and be able to recognize where we can do better and the things that we are doing that we should do more of as well. So. We really appreciate that, your, your thoughts and your comments, as well as um, Dr. Melchiori and Linda Henrich. Um, so for continuing education credit, if you are a member of the medical staff, I will pull your email out of the WebEx sign up and email you a, an evaluation to record your credit and you'll have to uh, just return that back via email to the med staff office and there's information that will accompany that email. And then um, for all others, I will send you a copy of the certificate and thank you for attending. And that is all we have for you. We will uh, record, uh, take the recording of this presentation and we'll get it posted on our cloud page. We appreciate all of you for attending and hope you can join us at our next Inclusive Care Series. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.